Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me to come talk today. Um, and thank you all for being here. So yeah, my name is Caitlin and I'm a grad student at UVM. Um, and I've spent the last two years working on this project that looks at wildlife movement um, around the state of Vermont and in the context of our roadways and our transportation structures. And we used a circuit theory approach um, to look at the movement of multiple important species in the region and used that information from the models and maps that we created along with some other data to rank our transportation structures by their connectivity value for wildlife. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Oops. So before I get started, just some quick acknowledgements here. Our research is funded by the Vermont Agency of Transportation, and it's a collaboration between um, Glenn Gingras and Chris Slasar of VTrans, Paul Marangelo and Ann Angerson with the Nature Conservancy in Vermont, Jens Helka with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and then my advisor, Dr. James Murdoch, and I at the University of Vermont. And we've also made some additional partners in this work, Dr. Kim Hall at the Nature Conservancy and Vincent Landau at Conservation Science Partners, who have both been a huge help with this project. And here is just an outline of what I'll be discussing today. I'll begin with a bit of project background, um, just to talk about why we're doing this wildlife and transportation research here and the background on the species that we studied. I'll then go into the methods and I'll spend quite a bit of time discussing our wildlife movement models in particular um, and the, pro the program that we use to create them, which I think is probably of the most interest to this group um, since there's a lot of maps that came out of it. And I'll also just mention some of the other metrics that we looked at and the terrestrial passage screening tool that we developed for VTrans to assess the value of transportation structures um, for wildlife movement and connectivity in Vermont. And then I'll finish up with some implications. And I'll have this little outline at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if you can see that yet. Oops. Um, just to, you know, orient you to where we are in the presentation since I have a lot of a lot of stuff to cover. Um, all right, so here is some regional context just to set the stage for our work here. Uh, this map shows the northern Appalachian Acadian ecoregion, which covers 330,000 square kilometers through the northeastern U.S. and southeastern Canada. And this is a very ecologically rich region with many different habitat types that are critical for supporting wildlife populations and the movement of wildlife species. And there have been many um, priority linkage areas identified for wildlife in the region, and these are areas that are important for landscape connectivity. And actually six of these linkage areas fall into parts of Vermont. So again, this is just a very important area for conserving wildlife connectivity, especially as the climate changes and these species begin to shift their ranges in response to the associated habitat changes. And there are multiple working groups and organizations focused on preserving and improving connectivity in the region. And some of you may be a part of these groups, but there's the Staying Connected Initiative, Two Countries, One Forest, Cold Hollow to Canada, and state and provincial chapters of the Nature Conservancy and others. So our partners here in Vermont are working to improve connectivity by making our roads and our transportation structures more permeable for wildlife movement. All right, so zooming in now on Vermont, we are obviously a very rural state. Um, we're 78% forested, but we are not immune to habitat fragmentation, of course. So we have over 25,000 kilometers of road in Vermont, and the public travels an estimated 11.4 billion kilometers annually on our roads, which I feel like is pretty pronounced during leaf peeper season right now. Um, but we also have over 88,000 state managed transportation structures, so things like culverts, bridges, and underpasses. And just about 6,000 of these structures are large enough for wildlife to pass through. So we'll return to that in just a minute. But roads present some real concerns for terrestrial wildlife populations. They can lead to direct mortality for animals through wildlife vehicle collisions. And this, of course, also presents real threats to humans as well. Um, wildlife vehicle collisions can be fatal or cause severe injuries, and they have a huge economic impact. Um, collisions involving large mammals alone in the U.S. cost $8.4 billion annually. And then in addition to the direct mortality aspect, roads can also lead to indirect mortality for wildlife. Fragmentation of habitat prevents species from accessing important resources and can lead to decreased dispersal and genetic exchange ac across the landscape, which can impact the viability of populations over time. 
And this is especially a concern, again, as the climate changes and species undergo rain shifts to follow those habitats and those resources that they, that they depend on. And like I just mentioned, Vermont is kind of centrally located in a region with many important movement corridors that species depend on. So it's important to mitigate these fragmentation effects of roads on wildlife, especially in our state. And one way to make our road barriers more permeable for wildlife movement is through the use of transportation structures like culverts, bridges, and underpasses. And thankfully, all road networks have these structures, some that are already helping wildlife cross the road and others that have the potential to do this with some modifications. So we can do a lot with what we already have, which is great, but we do need to work on some of these structures in order to make them more wildlife friendly. But modifications to structures can be pretty costly. Um, so in a perfect world with unlimited funding, we would retrofit all of our structures to make them more wildlife friendly. But in a small state like Vermont, where funding is more limited, we really need to prioritize resources to the structures that will have the greatest impact on connectivity, ideally for multiple species. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be getting any of those um, cool wildlife overpasses that you may have seen out west or in Canada. Um, those are extremely expensive and really the most cost effective approach is to work with the structures that we already have. And I mentioned that we have about 6,000 structures in Vermont that are potentially large enough for some wildlife species to cross through. And these are the, all of the state managed transportation structures that are greater than three feet in diameter. So VTRANS wanted a way to figure out which of these structures are most important for wildlife movement and landscape connectivity. And in fact, they wanted a way to rank all of these structures by their connectivity value for terrestrial wildlife species. So that way, when a maintenance or a construction project comes up for a specific structure, they can look at this list of rankings and see whether they should prioritize that structure for some wildlife uh, focused improvements while they're already working on it. Oh, and here are just a couple of maps to show those um, 25,000 plus kilometers of roads that we have in Vermont and 5,912, oops, transportation structure locations. I think we got somebody else's screen on here. <laughs> I'm not sure who's though. Do you see yeah. that or do I just see that? <laughs> no, you do. So, someone took over yeah. the screen share. Someone yeah, took over. Nancy, Nancy Patch has taken over. <laughs> I wonder if it'll just go back to mine if if Nancy unshares. I think you might have to request control again, Caitlin. Oh, I, yeah, I might just have to um let me browse for that slideshow again. Browse. Um, oh, I'm gonna have to re-upload it, I think. Whoops. Might take like a couple of minutes here. Um There's a lot of map images in the slideshow, so it takes. Oh, I think Nancy keeps jumping back in there. Or at least on my screen, keeps popping up. And we're back at least, it looks like. Yep. Oh, are you? Because I'm not. <laughs> oh, at least at the cover slide. Yep. Where was I? Structures. There we go. So you can all see that slide with the structures again? Yes. OK, great. Yeah, so, so I'm sorry. using NP on the screen. Oh, yeah, I think it keeps oh, popping never up. Never mind, it just changed. It's just sliding in. Yeah, no, you're right. Good. I think Nancy's screen comes on and then comes off periodically, at least for my, for my side of things. But anyway, I think it'll just pop me back into my slides. So um, yeah, so those are the 5,000 plus structures that we looked at for this analysis. Um, hopefully these slides are working for you all. And we had eight uh, terrestrial mammal species that we focused on. So American black bear, moose, white-tailed deer, coyote, bobcat, red fox, r raccoon, and striped skunk. I think that's all of them. Um, and these species were chosen for a few different reasons, but they have cultural, ecologic, and economic importance in Vermont. The larger bodied mammals in particular, like bear, moose, and deer, are especially iconic in the state. And they're also some of the more wide ranging species that um, cover great distances and frequently encounter roadways. And of course, they're also um, a big threat to motorists. I'm sure some of us have all had close calls with some of these species. Um, so those are the ones that we looked at. 
And then the goal of this project, again, was to assess the connectivity value of state managed transportation structures for terrestrial wildlife in Vermont. And we developed a terrestrial passage screening tool to rank structures by their connectivity value for these species. And to do this, we model the movements of those eight species at two spatial scales using an electrical circuit theory approach. Um, and again, this is what I'm going to be spending the most time discussing today, how we created those maps. But we also compile data on structure attributes, human development influence, and nearby protected lands to include in our structure rankings. And then finally, we ranked the structures according to these different metrics for all focal species combined um, using a decision-making framework. So let's just walk through each step of these methods here, starting with those connectivity models. As I mentioned, we used an electrical circuit theory <laughs> approach to model wildlife movement. And this method just treats the movement of animals like the flow of electricity through a circuit. So the landscape serves as the circuit and the map is made up of different resistances, which channels the flow of electricity or wildlife through less resistant paths in the landscape. And we use a tool called Omniscape for these analyses. I'm not sure if anyone here has uh, heard of or has used CircuitScape before, but this is another tool used to model connectivity with circuit theory. Um, CircuitScape is actually a bit easier to use since it's been around for longer and they have a nice ArcGIS toolbox called Linkage Mapper to run it, or there's also a desktop version. Um, Omniscape is essentially a newer version of CircuitScape and it's a bit more comprehensive in that it can add electricity into the landscape wherever your species occurs, rather than just at predetermined starting and ending locations. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but in CircuitScape, you have to define specific areas where your electricity is starting from and traveling toward. Um, but Omniscape lets us use additional data and puts electricity into the landscape wherever wildlife species are actually known to occur if you have those data. Um, so it allows the electricity also to travel in all possible directions, hence the omnidirectional name, um, instead of just from point A to point B. So it kind of reduces user bias a bit by incorporating that extra bit of data. And we modeled the movements of our eight species individually using Omniscape at two spatial scales. So first we modeled the broader landscape level movements of each species throughout Vermont. And an example of that is shown here on the left. And next, we modeled fine scale movements around each individual transportation structure using high resolution land cover data. So we had two scales, the landscape scale and the structure scale. And I'll walk through a visualization of the modeling process for both spatial scales. So there are two inputs that we need for Omniscape. The first input is called the source strength input, and this tells us where that electricity or wildlife are coming from in the landscape. The second input is the landscape resistance input, which represents the resistance in our circuit. So this layer contains land cover variables that are scored according to their relative resistance to the movement of the wildlife species. And then Omniscape is essentially just stacking that resistance map on top of the source strength map. And the source strength map is injecting the species electricity up into that resistance map. And then the species travel throughout the landscape most frequently in areas where there is lower resistance for them and areas of increased wildlife movement have a higher electrical current density in the output. And these areas are shown in yellow in the maps on the left, or sorry, right. So let's dig into those inputs a little bit more, starting with the source strength input. Um, we use existing wildlife occurrence or occupancy data for this input to tell us where in the landscape our species electricity is coming from. And these data are from Pierman Gilman et al. and resulted from an extensive expert opinion survey across the whole northeastern U.S. And these occupancy models were created at multiple resolutions and had 74 variables of land cover, climate, and other abiotic factors. And these models were all tested against empirical wildlife data and performed well. Um, so we we're very lucky to have uh, or be able to use these data in our analysis. But um, these occupancy maps pretty much just tell us the probability of occurrence of a given species in each pixel of the landscape. So in Omniscape, this determines where the electricity is coming from in the landscape, but also how much electricity is coming out of those locations. 
the electricity output is proportional to the occupancy probability in the pixel. So for example, a pixel that has a 90% probability of deer occurrence would emit more electricity than a pixel that only has a 20% probability of occurrence. And then next we have the landscape resistance layer. And this layer tells us how the electricity moves around the landscape based on the composition of land cover and the resistance of different land cover types to the movement of each species. And resistance layers can be created in multiple ways, but uh, due to a lack of empirical wildlife movement data for all of these species in Vermont, we decided to use expert elicitation to get at these values for each of the focal species. And we reached out to 10 regional wildlife experts and used the following approach to collect resistance information. We began with an online expert opinion survey. So experts were asked to score the resistance of each land cover type to the movement of the species that they have expertise in. And these scores were based on a one to 100 scale with 100 representing the most resistance to movement of their species. Um, and then since we were creating models at two spatial scales, experts actually had to score two land cover data sets for us. So first they scored variables in the 30 meter NLCD resolution or 30 meter resolution NLCD data set for use in our broader landscape scale models. And then they had to score variables in the half meter Vermont high resolution land cover data set for use in our structure scale models. And then next we took the averages of those expert values for each species and assigned those averages to the land cover variables in each data set. And we use these sort of like first drafts of our resistance inputs to run preliminary omniscape models at the full extent, the landscape scale for each species, and then for five test structures at the structure scale for each species. And then we went through some one on one follow up meetings with each expert to present these first drafts of the Omniscape maps and get feedback on whether or not they thought them to be representative of the movements of their species in Vermont. Um, so because scoring the resistance of land cover to wildlife movement can be a little bit of a tricky concept, we felt that this was an important step just so the experts could see how their initial values actually influence the models. And then they were given one opportunity to rescore variables if they felt that the maps could be improved to better uh, show the movement of their species. And then final resistance layers were created from those average values or the average uh, updated values from each expert. Something I haven't mentioned yet um, is the moving window analysis that Omniscape actually does to perform these connectivity calculations. So the movement around any given pixel in, a land, in the landscape is constrained by this moving window, which performs all of the calculations. So when you run Omniscape, the moving window will sort of center on that first pixel in the landscape um, and calculate connectivity from all of those source strength pixels within the window back into that center pixel, which is acting as the ground in the circuit. And then it records all of the, the amount of current traveling back into that pixel. Then the moving window will move and center on the next pixel in the landscape and perform all of those calculations again, and it just keeps moving across the entire landscape until it hits every pixel. Um, and then it, it sums all of the resulting maps together to get a map of cumulative current flow across the landscape. To visualize this a little bit better, I wanted to show how changing the size of the moving window affects the results. So here's an example from our pilot analysis using data from American Martin. Um, this is a species in the weasel family that's endangered in Vermont with only really a few areas of potential occupancy probability. So it's easy to visualize the differences um, that happen from changing the moving window size here. I don't have the occupancy map um, shown, but for Martin, when you set your moving window to their average home range size of seven kilometers in the map on the left, the movements are basically constrained just to the areas that they occupy since this species doesn't typically travel very far. But if you use a moving window size based on a wider range of say dispersal distances, so going beyond their normal day-to-day -day movements and including some more rare movements, um, you get them expanding out a bit farther from the areas that they occupy and that's shown in the center map. Or you can go even more wild with this and use the largest known dispersal distance, um, which for Martin was an individual that traveled 163 kilometers 
but this is definitely not um, the norm for the species. And that resulting map on the right would suggest that we have Martin moving all around Vermont, which really is not the case. The species sticks to specific areas and doesn't travel very far. I ended up using the average home range size of each species based on studies we have from Vermont or close by as our moving window size. So in our models, the electricity is able to travel as far as the average radius of a circular home range for each species. And this helps us get at the average movements of each species, which is really what we want to understand for this analysis. Um, or in other words, under average conditions and wildlife movement patterns, where will these species be approaching the road in our transportation structures? And I should also note that some of these species have pretty large home ranges anyway, um, so they are able to travel pretty far in an omniscape analysis. And I did try running one of these wide ranging species with an even larger dispersal distance um, as the moving window size, but it actually timed out on the UVM supercomputer. So there are some computational constraints with using a very large moving window size. All right, so when we combine our source strength and our resistance inputs and we set our moving window size for each species, these are what the final Omniscape maps look like at the landscape scale. To summarize our landscape scale results, we took the average amount of electrical current density within a one kilometer radius of each transportation structure and did that from each of these individual species maps. And then we added those species specific averages together to combine the results into an all species result. I also just wanted to quickly show one more way to look at uh, and interpret the data from each species. And this is a bit of a tangent. Um, this is not something we're doing for the VTrans analysis, but this is just another neat way to classify the Omniscape outputs depending on what your research objectives are. Um, and I figure this is a crowd that enjoys maps, so why not show more ways to look at the same map? Um, so with a regular Omniscape analysis, you end up with that cumulative current map across the landscape, like the map for moose shown here on the left. But there's also the option to create a normalized current map when you run Omniscape, which basically compares the model that you're running with your defined resistance values to a sort of null model um, where all of the resistances for every land cover variable are set to one, which is the least resistant value. And that is shown in the map on the right. So Omniscape will create a normalized current map by dividing your model by this null model. And then the normalized map that results can be classified into different breaks that tell you how your model compares to this theoretical perfect landscape that has no resistance. And these are what the different breaks tell us. So the channelized and intensified classes represent areas that have more or much more current than you would expect in a perfect landscape that has no resistance anywhere. So this highlights areas of increased predicted wildlife movement where your species might sort of be pushed through based on the composition and the resistance of land cover in your model. And then diffuse flow is as much current as you would expect in a perfect landscape. So this is where the species movements are less constrained and they're able to spread out a bit more. Um, and impeded areas are places where there is less current than you would expect in a perfect landscape. So places where you're not seeing as much wildlife movement in your model as you would if uh, in a model where there is no resistance there. And these class breaks for the normalized current maps are based on different standard deviations from the mean of the normalized map. And again, this is kind of all supplemental information, so I won't go further into the weeds with this now, but I'm happy to answer any questions about it at the end if, if anyone's interested. OK, so back to our, our normal Omniscape map uh, results here. So the map on the left shows what all of the species models look like when the results are added together. And then on the right, we have the all species averages within one kilometer of each transportation structure. So this is how the structures would sort of preliminarily rank just based on the landscape level analysis alone. And then we also ran those high resolution lit structure scale models. Um, since we use that very fine scale half meter Vermont land cover data set, these were a bit more computationally intensive to run. Um, so for these, we ran Omniscape within a 100 meter radius of each structure, and then we summarized the results in a 50 meter radius to avoid including uh, edge effects in the results. And we again took the average electrical current density in this 50 meter radius of each structure and added those species specific averages together for our structure ranking later on. And since we ran these for each species individually around 
5,912 structures. Um, we ended up running a total of 47,296 Omniscape analyses around these transportation structures. So we have eight little maps, just like this one on the left, for each structure that we looked at. And um, these models took about four days to run per species, and we ran them on the UVM, uh, the Blue Moon cluster of the UVM supercomputer. Um, and actually, our final species just finished running last week, so I've been pretty busy organizing and analyzing all the data now that um, all of our species are done. But it was really great to use such a fine scale land cover data set um, and to have that available for Vermont since it really added to our analysis of these structure sites themselves. There are some fine scale habitats that certain species will move through that are not captured at the 30 meter NLCD resolution that we use for the landscape scale models. So for example, bobcats will often travel along hedgerows in agricultural areas. And we were able to capture potential movement along hedgerows leading up to the roadway by using this fine scale land cover data. Um, and this was also a data set that our partners identified as a priority to use um, since they were really interested in those fine scale movements. And I won't show 47,000 maps of these today, so don't worry about that. All right, so that was a lot of information about our connectivity models, um, but I do wanna quickly mention some of the other metrics that we included in our overall structure rankings. We completed additional analyses to help rank structures, and these were really spearheaded by Paul Marangelo and Ann Ingerson at the Nature Conservancy Vermont chapter. Um, they went through various structure databases to compile data on attributes important for wildlife, like the length of the structure and the bank full width ratio, or how wide the structure is compared to the bank. Um, and they also included a metric for the influence of human development surrounding a structure where they buffered 50 meters around each building footprint or E911 point to account for human activity around more than just the building footprints themselves. And then they calculated the percentage of this human development influence within 150 meters of each transportation structure location. And finally, they included an analysis of protected lands, calculating the amount of protected land around each structure and whether a structure has protected lands on zero, one, or two sides of the roadway. And this is of interest since these areas will probably not experience much human development through time. Um, so structures that are surrounded by large blocks of protected land are going to be especially valuable for wildlife connectivity into the future. And then all of these data feed into our terrestrial passage screening tool. So the results of the connectivity analyses at both scales, uh, the analyses done on structure attributes, human development influence and protected lands, um, all of those things. And the tool is built in Microsoft Excel and it's formatted as a linear programming decision-making framework. So the first step is to normalize all of the raw data from each analysis so that all of the results are on the same zero to 100 scale. Next, we evaluate the normalized data against a set of constraints. And we included adjustable thresholds in the tool so transportation managers can have flexibility in the rankings. So for example, you could rank all structures that are less than 180 feet in length as a constraint. And there are also adjustable weights for the results of each analysis. So if you want your landscape scale omniscape results to be um, more important or have more weight than the structure scale, that's something you could do with those adjustable weights. And then finally, we ranked all of the structures according to their overall wildlife movement priority. And this first wildlife movement priority rank um, includes the results of the connectivity analyses at both the landscape and structure scale, so those omniscape models, uh, as well as the human development influence metric that I quickly mentioned. And this rank tells us whether a structure is a priority for wildlife movement. We also included two additional ranks. So this second structure characteristics rank evaluates the condition of the structure for wildlife. So structures that are longer in length or have a smaller bank full width ratio would receive a worse score here because they're not as easy for wildlife to move through. And then this third protected lands rank assesses the amount and the location of protected lands around the structure. So structures with large blocks of protected land on both sides of the roadway would receive the best score here. So really one way for a manager to interpret and use these rankings is to first check that um, whether the structure has a good wildlife movement priority rank. This would mean that the structure is in a good location for wildlife to be passing through in the first place. 
And then next they could check the structure characteristics rank. Um, and if the structure scores poorly here, it's probably a structure that needs some work to make it a bit more wildly friendly. And then if they really need some more supplemental, supplemental information to make the case for working on a structure, they could look at the protected lands rank. And if the structure score is high here, um, this location might be especially important for wildlife based improvements. And then one more feature that we included in the tool is the ability to look up a structure by structure ID, which pulls up all of the ranking information and the original raw data associated with it. So in most cases, VTRANS will be looking at these ranks as they have construction projects come up all the time, um, and they'll want to look up the specific ID of a structure for one that they're planning to work on to see if it could also use some wildlife improvements. And then here are the top 100 structure locations just for that first wildlife movement priority rank. So based on the results of the landscape and structure scale omniscape analyses and the human development influence analysis, these are examples of some of the places where wildlife are most likely to encounter transportation structure based on their movement patterns. And this ranking also does not include any adjustments to uh, the weights or the constraints. So this is kind of a basic ranking of structures um, with all analyses having equal weight. And again, managers are able to adjust these weights and constraints in order to rank a specific subset of structures depending on their needs. We've also been collecting game camera data for this project at a total of 52 structure locations statewide uh, beginning in 2015. And we've recorded detection and passage rate data for each species at these locations. Detections are recorded if an animal just shows up on any of the cameras near the structure and a successful passage is recorded if the animal actually crosses through the structure. So right now I'm I'm working on using these data to kind of check the rankings of our structures with game cameras. Um, so the detection data in particular is being used to test the wildlife movement priority rank since detections are just telling us whether a species is present and moving around in the location of the structure, which is also what our wildlife movement priority rank is telling us. So that's what I'm working on this week. Stay tuned for those results. Um, so what will all of this information and the structure rankings actually lead to? I haven't really talked yet about the types of improvements that might be considered for certain locations, but there are many different things that we can do to make them more appealing. So wildlife might choose to cross through a structure rather than over the road. For example, VTRANS might decide to change the substrate of the structure. Um, this image here shows a bridge location that has some large boulders as that movement surface. Um, and while this is great for this groundhog who actually lived in this location amongst all of these rocks for a little while, it's not so great for deer, which sometimes choose to walk through rivers instead of trying to walk over these large boulders. And inevitably, they'll also sometimes choose to walk over roads rather than walking over those large boulders. Um, so to improve a structure for deer, we can fill in these, these rocks to create a more even surface for ungulates to walk on. On the other hand, if there's a lot of water going through a structure, Bobcats will sometimes opt to use the shelves that allow them to pass without walking through the water. So this is something that can be added to structures as well. And those are really just a couple of examples of what can be done with these rankings. And again, the ultimate goal here is to prioritize these types of investments in these improvements to the locations that are actually seeing wildlife traffic so that they'll be used and have the greatest benefit. And here are just some, some other takeaways um, from the analyses that I worked on. I think that the Omniscape program we used was an incredibly useful tool for the goals of this project. So it allowed us to model wildlife movement over a large area of multiple resolutions um, in a pretty cost-effective way. It's, it's a lot cheaper than putting GPS collars on a, a bunch of animals all over the state. Um, and Omniscape itself is free and relatively easy to use, despite not having its own ArcGIS toolbox yet, but hopefully that will come soon. Um, for now, you just need to learn how to write a couple of lines of code in a free programming language called Julia. And there are many applications with Omniscape beyond the species specific modeling that we did. So you can do more general models of species movements, like for broad groups of plant or animal species. And you can look at how climate might affect species movements. Um, and folks have even modeled how fire might move across the landscape in regions that have to worry about fire spreading through certain land cover types. 
Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty neat tool that I would definitely recommend and I look forward to using more soon in, in my own research. Um, I think that's all I have. So thanks for sitting through all of that. And I'm happy to stick around and talk about all of this stuff and answer questions and feel free to email me if you come up with questions later. Great, thanks, Caitlin. Um, folks have questions and now we have open until 1030 at least, uh, open for conversation and question and answer. So feel free and uh, also use the raise the hand uh, little button if you'd like to uh, ask a question. Jess, you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Caitlin. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, I, in the past, and my colleagues, uh, certainly in other parts of the world in North America, have run kinds of iterations of this. Um, you know, the most simplest of which is least cost path analyses for human movement, and then, you know, more, um, more factors into sort of a weighted cost surface. So the idea of circuit theory is really interesting. And you mentioned land cover, a data set with land cover. Can you just get into a, a few more specifics about what factors are actually um, going into, you know, impedance resistance? Is it slope? Is it um, built structures? Is it, uh, you know, it, anything it would be interesting just to hear yeah yeah definitely those are great points and so we kind of went with a more basic model of just looking at all of the different nlcd land cover classes that we have in the state but there are some models that have incorporated slope um and you can do a whole bunch of different things with this like you could have different resistances applied to different levels of slope you can have different resistances applied to the distance from certain things so distance to water if you're further from water that could have a, a more resistance for your species than if you're closer to bodies of water um, distance to human development you can incorporate all of those things into a resistance surface since we were looking at eight species um, and pretty common and wide-ranging species in vermont for this analysis we kind of just stuck with the basic land cover model for this the only thing i did to sort of update the nlcd um, and the the VCGI data sets were to add on top of them um, more detailed road classes. So those six classes of roads that I showed kind of early on in the slides. Um, I worked with someone at, at VTrans to break those into broad categories of road based on um, the size of the roads and traffic volume information that they have so that different resistances could be applied to different road types. Um, but yeah, you can do a lot of things with the resistance surface if you've got the time and the resources to put into it. So great question. Yeah, and thanks a lot. This was super impressive. I, I'm definitely going to check it out. I don't know when I'm going to have access to a supercomputer, but uh, fingers crossed. Oh, yeah, and I should say you don't need a supercomputer to run Omniscape, but like if you're going to run the with the half meter Vermont land cover data set, you might, um, depending on the amount of you know areas you're looking at or how big of an area it is. But I, I'm able to run Omniscape on my personal computer. Um, and you can always course in the resolution too. Like with those Martin examples I showed as our pilot uh, study, I think those were 900 by 900 meter pixels. And that ran in just a couple of hours on my computer. But 30 by 30, I can run on my computer too. It, for the whole state of Vermont, for some species, it takes a couple of days. Um, and there are shortcuts you can take in the program. So rather than focusing on every single pixel in the landscape, you can skip a few pixels here and there to kind of speed things up a little bit. So you can do it on your computer too. <laughs> That's good to know. Thanks a million. Yeah. Sounds like Kay has a question. Uh, if you'll be able to share the slides um, and yeah, the, particular, the, slides. the spreadsheet afterwards. Yeah, um, I'd have to double check with VTrans on that because they're technically the owners of all the data now, but we're working on our final report um, this week. I think we're submitting it at the end of this week for VTrans, and so that will be publicly available with all of the information I talked about today. Um, and the map of those structures will be in that report as well, I believe. So that'll all be on the VTrans website, and I'll double check on the spreadsheet. But. 
And again, sure. those those top 100 structures are like all of the analyses are weighted equally. So depending on what you want to look at, those top 100s would change a little bit. Um, sorry, go ahead. Hi, so. Caitlin. I was just going to follow up on the question around or the, the comment around the supercomputer. And um, I was just curious around your experience in um, using it and loading the Omniscape or your data into it and mm -hmm. uh, how long it took to run and, and how dependent was this on, on the supercomputer? Yeah, um, great questions. I, before starting this, did not know what a supercomputer was. I still don't really know what a supercomputer is, but if I can figure it out, I think anyone can figure it out. Um, we, because we, um, most of our models were only ready to begin running at kind of midway point this past summer, and we had this October deadline, we ended up running all of them on the supercomputer at both scales. Um, that being said, I could have run the landscape scale species on my personal computer. It just would have taken a few more days, um, and I was just trying to get it all done very quickly, especially because we had to do two rounds of like the first draft of the maps and then the second draft of the maps. So due to time constraints, I did everything on the supercomputer. Um, timing, it varies per species, and the time really depends on how much source strength you have going into it. So, I mean, if you have a species like Martin that's not very common in Vermont, you only have a few places where they're actually coming into the landscape, that type of model would run a lot quicker than some of these other species that are just all like deer everywhere in Vermont. Um, so I think the deer and the bear model took a couple of days to run on the supercomputer and some of the other species ran in like four hours for the landscape scale. And then all of the structure scale models took exactly four days to run per species. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure in terms of like getting on the super supercomputer outside of UVM. I just know as a student I was able to use it, but I'm sure that they allow folks to like pay to use it or uh, I'm not the best one to answer the VACC questions, but it's the Vermont Advanced Computing Corps is who you would reach out to for supercomputer questions. Um, Great, yeah. thank you. I don't know who raised hands first, and there's also some chats going on. Looks like uh, the first question was uh, from Ryan about making the data accessible or the results accessible via the portal. Yeah, again, I got to double check with VTrans. I think we had some discussion with our partners about putting those landscape scale maps on BioFinder. Um, but yeah, I have to, I, we're turning all the data over this week, so I'll, I'll make sure to ask all of these questions about where it's going to be. Um, yeah, I'll write down everybody's name so I know who to reach out to. <laughs> Good deal, I think James Brady was, was next and then Katharina. Hey, hey, Caitlin, it was uh, a great uh, catching up with the project. This is, is awesome work. Excited to see some of the um, uh, additions uh, since I last was involved. But I was curious, I know that in the past VTrans had uh, kind of separated out data specifically for deer, kind of having two sets, one all species, one all species minus deer. Is that is that um, has that been discussed? I know because deer take kind of more of a sheet flow approach to movement over um, our landscape, um, and it could s potentially manipulate uh, prioritizing structures, which are kind of more acute. Um, I'm just curious to know if that's been discussed. Yeah, no, and, and it has been discussed. And um, because we ran all of the species individually, it's it's easy enough to look at a ranking with deer subtracted out. I actually made this tool for all species combined, but then I also have separate spreadsheets of separate rankings for each species individually. So if that's something that they wanted to look at, that's definitely something they could do. Um, but in terms of, you know, motorist threat and deer being one of the species that people are encountering on roads pretty frequently, I think that's kind of why we ended up keeping deer in the model with the other species. Um, yeah, that makes total sense, right? Yeah. There's, um, right, you, you notice when you hit a deer, you don't necessarily notice when you hit many other species so um, unless you swerve for the which people do swerve for the other species too but yes. yeah <laughs> so right now they're all they're all weighted the same um but you know they'll have all of the data and if they wanted to look at species specific things they could for sure great well thank you thanks i don't it's know like who that. Katharina has a question <laughs> 
Yeah. Hi, Caitlin. Um, Katie Geeter here. Uh, great presentation. That's that's really fantastic work. I can't believe all the layers of information <laughs> that you've that you've looked at. It's really fascinating. Um, I was kind of thinking, as you were going through uh, the presentation, I I was thinking if you have discussed any ways to bring in kind of additional layers of risk um, using road mortality data or road collision data. Um, I know that can be spotty, uh, but at least for some key species like deer and bear that are kind of hard to model in the first place because of their, their movement patterns or their occurrence on the landscape. I was wondering if you had ever discussed um, maybe incorporating some of that for some of the species or and how you might go about doing that using Omniscape. Yeah, great question. We were actually considering road mortality data to test some of the rankings in the end, um, but Vermont, unfortunately, right now doesn't have any consistently or systematically collected roadkill data, and the location information for that is really the most important thing. So even if we do have roadkill data for some of these species, you know, for, for one deer, you might have just the name of the road and the town, and for another animal, you just have the name of the road. <laughs> and, and it's not always like GPS coordinate level. Um, so that's something that, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll move toward collecting more standardized data because that would be great for testing these models. Um, and yeah, perhaps incorporating them somehow into the landscape resistance layer. But because we did it with expert opinion, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how it would get incorporated there. Um, but yeah, my, my advisor and I are actually starting a new project soon um, where we'll be replacing the expert opinion piece with genetic data. So, you know, Jed, so yeah, we're going to be doing like a genetic uh, piece for that landscape resistance layer. So it'll be interesting to see how um, that compares with the model outputs from expert opinion. But yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's just valuable to know that it would be valuable information. So yeah. I will. Tell be back in touch about that in the future. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. Thanks. Looks like there's one more question, Caitlin, about access to slides after the show. I know we recorded this and we'll plan to make that available via our EGC channel, but would you also be willing to share a PDF of the slides? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I might just want to tweak it a little because I have those animations pop up on a few, maybe I need to like pull those out into different slides, but I can definitely share a PDF or PowerPoint or whatever works. Good deal. Yeah, we'll post that uh, via our EGC channel. And I guess just in the interest of the time, just one last question. I think this is particularly exemplary of what we are trying to do at the EGC or Enterprise Geodata or Enterprise GIS Consortium, uh, which is showcasing work that cuts across the different agencies uh, not only in state government, but GIS across different organizations like TNC. So what, what advice do you have for us at the state, you know, GIS people of how to do this work across what may not come to us, you know, as default, uh, working across agencies, divisions on a common interest? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of walked up into a very, walked into a very well set up project where all of these partners were already established and, you know, the Nature Conservancy, Fish and Wildlife and VTrans have been working on transportation and wildlife research for many, many years. Um, but I think, you know, like you said, they're kind of united by a common goal, which is to improve our roads for wildlife. And and everybody is really motivated um, to do this research and, and eventually looped in UVM on this as well. So I don't know, I think just having common interests and um, it was extremely valuable to have everybody's voices at the table for this project. I mean, I learned so much about transportation decision making um you know i didn't know much about roads or culverts and now i go to like transportation conferences and listen to like talks about asphalt and things like that so just having like a lot of different voices in your group um that all want to work to toward a common goal is key for this type of project i think if that answers your question <laughs> it does it does um, any last comments or, or questions for Caitlin before we depart before our normal uh, meeting at 1030 begins? If not, uh, uh, one more question here by uh, Catherine Otto. Could the recording also be posted to VTrans? Uh, yes, we'll we'll make that available by EGC and, and certainly you can post it elsewhere, including the, the research symposium site. Uh, I don't see any problem there.
and we have um, a research symposium page for our project, which has from this past September symposium. So that has like a poster and a fact sheet and a cup, I think maybe two videos about our project. Um, and there was also a symposium page last year too. So. Good deal. Well, again, thank you all for your time and thank you most, Caitlin, for presenting with us. Um, very much appreciated. And for everyone else, um, our normal meetings, a separate EGC meeting start at 1030, so we'll break and see you then. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Yeah.